This morning I want to talk to you about uh, the scripture that Rico read to us um, about the sovereignty of God and the worthiness of our King and how worthy He is and to be adored. Um, it was so in line with what uh, the Lord laid on my heart for us this morning. I want to talk to you this, mo- this morning about a topic that is a little bit uncomfortable when it comes to Jesus and Jesus' teachings. There are some things that we swallow easy, some things that really just fits, you know, even inside and outside of the church. If we say, uh, God is love, that is embraced, you know, because it is, and we embrace it inside and outside of the church. If we, if we tell about Jesus healing the blind man, we're all encouraged by it and seeing how wonderfully loving God is and how he would do a miracle to open a man that was born blind from his birth uh, um, to open his eyes. It's so beautiful. But what happens when the lion becomes the, uh, when the lamb becomes the lion? You see, because the word of God proclaims our king to be the lion and the lamb. Isn't it so? It's wonderful for us. It's glorious when we just embrace Jesus as the lamb. The suffering lamb. The the lamb that brought salvation. The lamb that redeemed our sins. Paid the price for us, which he did. But make no mistake, Scripture is clear. That the lion and the lamb is one. Amen? Now read with me. I'm going to read from verse 11, Mark 11, verse 11. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. The next day, they were leaving Bethany, and Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to uh, find out if it had any fruit. But when he reached it, he found nothing but leaves, because it was not seasoned for figs. Verse 14, then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there, and he overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves, and he would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. As he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers? The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. Now in the morning as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. And Peter remembered it and said, Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered so far. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your precious spirit, Holy Spirit. We thank you that you reveal your word within us. And we pray, Lord, that you would come and do as only you can, that you would bring your word to to minister to us and to do exactly what you've sent it out to do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. These are one of, the, one of those passages that is just a little bit uncomfortable in Scripture. So much so that T.W. Manson wrote about this encounter with Jesus with the fig tree. He, he literally wrote this. He said, It is a tale of miraculous power wasted in the service of ill temper. For the natural energy employed to blast the unfortunate tree might have been more useful expressed in forcing a crop of figs out of season. And as it stands, it is simply incredible. This is a commentary on Mark chapter 11. Also, 
William Barclay agrees. He actually adds this. He says, this story does not seem worthy of Jesus. There seems to be perpetuance in it. Because what do we see? What do we see? We see Jesus walking with his disciples after he's been welcomed into Jerusalem as the king. People shouting Hosanna just the day before. Proclaiming to be the king, throwing their clothes, their possessions, their, 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 their uh, palm branches, welcoming, uh, welcoming him as king, as victor. Now they had a very different mindset, but they welcomed him as king. And Jesus moved into Jerusalem, into the temple, and what he saw there, just he went home to Bethany, it says, because it was already late. Now next day, on his way back to the temple, he saw this fig tree. It looked very beautiful. Scripture says it was full of leaves. If you've seen a fig tree, fig tree's leaves are beautiful leaves. It's a green tree. It's a full tree. This fig tree was full, full of leaves. But the commentaries on this encounter is about Jesus almost being like a Angry child, or acting childish. Why, why, why would, I can't find any fruit, but it's not time for figs. That's in scripture, yes. It's not time for figs, but the fig tree looks good, but there's no fruit, and Jesus just curses the tree. Hence these two commentaries. And there's actually quite a few that comments very negatively on this. So, so what would we say to these objections? Doesn't sound right, does it? That Jesus would be unfair towards this fig tree. It's very quiet in here. That Jesus would act so abruptly, so harshly almost. What would we say to this? Well, first of all, Psalm 24 says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Every fig tree, every human, every apple tree, every mulberry tree, every wonder tree, every brush, every desert, every ocean, everything belongs to him. Number one, he can do with it as he wants. You say, wait, 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 we also belong to him. Exactly. So it's all is, number one. Number two, if we believe lower creation does not have a soul like a tree or an animal, it's not that Jesus deprived the fig tree of eternal life. Thirdly, if Jesus does not, not know and, and at no time Jesus does anything coincidentally. So would he have a purpose? Amen. So who was there? Jesus, the fig tree, and the disciples. Who do you think the lesson was for? Oh, the fig tree. <laughs> Jesus did not spitefully curse the tree because he was hungry. I think there's enough evidence that Jesus did not bother himself with food too much. Some of you are looking at what are you talking about? Have you ever heard about the 40 days in the desert? Yeah? Have you ever read how many times Jesus rebuked his disciples because they're about food and he's about the people? Yeah? So it wasn't about Jesus being hungry. I think it could go a little bit further without the figs. So, so can we say it was about the people around him? When we put our human perspective, our human nature and things, we look at the fig tree and we think, poor fig tree. Isn't it so? But his ways is above our ways that the heavens are above the earth. And we think poor fig tree, but here we are in 2024. 
talking about the most famous victory in history. Come on. You can smile. It's okay. There's no other victory that has been spoken of so well, so many times, over and over, than this victory being cursed. It might have just I've had a short life, but it served a wonderful purpose. Yeah. Isn't it so? Have you ever heard a fig tree preach? Yeah. You give it to Jesus, he will make that fig tree preach. Yes. With or without fruit. Come on. So Jesus went and he asked, listen, he looked for fruit, but there was no fruit on the tree. Outside of season. And Jesus rebuilt the fig tree. Why? When in doubt, read on. Let's read. So after Jesus rebuilt this fig tree, the next day, well, with, you know, Jesus seeing the, the, in the distance the fig tree, this is now, sorry, in verse 14, then he said to the three, may no one ever eat from your fruit again. And his disciples heard him say it. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. Now, just follow with me a little bit. It is, isn't it interesting? Isn't it interesting? We, we, we understand it when Jesus talks about fruit and the vine and the branches and delivering fruit. We, we, we feel a little bit uncomfortable when Jesus rebukes a fig tree. And then right after that, Jesus goes into the temple and he does what? Come on, you read it with me. What did he do? He overturned the tables. Threw the tables over. I almost got myself so far as to overturn a table on the pulpit this morning. I was already, I saw your faces already. And you would have been indignant. Can you believe a pastor? I was, I'm, I'm just going to explain to you what I, what I wanted to do. I wanted to do a, put, a, put a table right here. And then when I started preaching, go to the table and say, you know, who put that table there? <laughs> and all, would have, all of you would have gone, I know. He had, see, he's got a temper, that guy. <laughs> I told you, it's just like something that wants to come out. Watch. Because we don't like that. When pastors throw tables around on the pulpit. How do you think they felt? You think this was a quiet encounter? This was a lamb kind of an encounter? Now Jesus came into the temple, overturned tables. Threw everything out. This was not in the beginning of his ministry. He actually weaved a whoop. And he chased them out of the temple. Now he overturned the tables. Second time he's doing it. Overturned the tables. And then he stopped. Every, everybody was taking shortcut through the temple. Let me explain this to you. The, 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 this court was a court for the Gentiles. They were able to come that portion of the temple. Just outside of the wall. They were able to be there. They had to pay but they could be there. But it wasn't supposed to be a temple that were there or the, a court that was there. Uh, it, was, it was holy. It was there for a specific purpose. It was there so that they could experience the glory of God, so that they could bring their hearts, their requests, so that they can also be ministered to and be prayed for but, but, and, and could experience the holiness of God. But now they use this as a, as a shortcut. Because if you wanted to go around the temple, there was a lot longer way to get on the other side. So they just used that as a shortcut. Now, look at Jesus. Jesus throwing tables over and then stopping them, saying, you will not pass here. 
Where are you going? I said, Pete, you're reading too much into this. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves, and he would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple. The Mishnah actually had a law that said you're not allowed to carry your staff through the temple because they knew this is what they were doing. But now, what God's people did with the temple actually contributed to how they saw the temple. There was a huge crowd there. It was Passover. Those that were there were supposed to, and they, they, they had to pay. Let me explain to you why all of these money changes were there. They had to pay. There's a lot of people that had to pay half a shekel would be given to every male worshiper over 20 years of age. I had to pay half a shekel. But there was a rule. You could not pay with money with adulterous images on it, so you had to exchange the money to, for a Tyrian coin. Now, to exchange the money, those that exchange the money would ask you a fee to exchange the money so that you can pay the money to be in the temple. And the rest of it was selling of livestock so that they could offer. They were selling livestock, fell, wine, salt for the sacrifices, everything that was for the temple, but now they were doing their business there. Now they were making the temple something else that God intended it to be. As I explained to you, the Gentiles used this as a through fare, a, a shortcut to get to the Mount of Olives. It was a huge court for a specific purpose. It was the same temple that when it was dedicated, it was on the same place that when the temple of Solomon was dedicated, the people could not stand in the presence of God. It was the same place where Isaiah got a word, of a, a, a prophetic word from God and, de and acclaimed and, and declared, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty in Isaiah 6, uh, Isaiah 6 verse 3. In Isaiah 6 verse 5, it says, Woe to me, I'm ruined, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I've, I live among people of unclean lips. My eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. This is a holy place. They made it everything but what it was destined for and what it was called to be. So Jesus, seeing these money changers, and the doves and everything being sold and, 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 and bartering happening, Jesus turned over these tables. Let me ask you. I explained to you what I wanted to do. Have you ever seen a table being turned over? Have you seen? Turning a table over is a violent act. It's a confronting act. It's not something to be taken lightly. Also not to be taken lightly seeing Jesus standing in the court keeping people from going through. How many people do you think were there at Passover? There were hordes of people. Multitudes of people. See, we are, we are comfortable with Jesus sitting at the well with the woman in John 4. We are comfortable with learning about the Jesus that, as I told you last week, said to Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, come, I want to eat at your house. We are comfortable with that Jesus. But we forget it's the same Jesus that stands in the temple courts after all the tables have been turned over and blocking people, saying you will not go through here. This is not what this was meant to be. This is a house of prayer. You've made it a den of robbers. 
We are not so comfortable with that Jesus. It is because we have the same kind of commentary in our heart that those commentaries about the fig tree that you've heard. This is not fit with Jesus. Why, why would Jesus be so angry? Why would Jesus be so unfair? Because we don't understand that that fig tree is still preaching. Even to this very day, those tables are still preaching. Jesus in the temple courts blocking people from moving over holy ground and pretending as if it is nothing Still preaches. Our Savior is a lamb. Our Savior is Savior. But our Savior is also judge. The gentleness of Christ is very well known. Matthew eleven twenty nine 29 says, For I am gentle and humble in heart. Matthew 5, verse 5 says, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. But meekness is not weakness. Meekness, if you want to verbalize it, is strength, is power under control. Meekness has the strength to deny oneself, but meekness also boldly defends others. Meekness will lay down Shows us what it means when Christ lays down his own life. But meekness is also presented when Jesus defends the weak. When he stands up for those that suffer. It is the same Christ that is described as meek. The same one. This God of ours proclaims himself to be holy. He says, be holy because the Lord, your God, is holy in Leviticus 1. As individuals, as that temple, as the church, and as individuals, we are called to be exactly what God has called us to be. Is that true? As individuals, you might say, Piet, wait a minute, that was for them. That was what they, what they were doing. As individuals today, is, is, is the tree still preaching to us? We'll talk about what it's saying just now. Is the temple, the tables, and Jesus in the temple, is that still ministering to us? You know why? Because now... According to Peter, according to Christ, we are his temples. You see where I'm going, right? As individuals, we are temples of God's Spirit. We are called to holiness. And covetousness is at odds with God's holiness. Greed is at odds with God's holiness. Being about things that he's not about is at odds with God's holiness, especially if the temple and the court we are dealing with is there to proclaim the goodness, the holiness, the sovereignty of God to a people that do not know him yet. If that court, the court of the Gentiles was specifically there so that they that were not part of Israel yet could see the glory and the majesty of God. And we are his temples today. Are we not called to the same purpose? What are our temple courts about? What do we present? Are we taking shortcut? Are we bartering? What are we doing with what belongs to him? Let me ask you, or let me make a statement. On that day, Jesus meant business. It was just a different kind of business that they were doing. What was he saying? 
As everything was in turmoil, all the tables were on the ground, all the money and the coins were rolling all across the floor. People were fighting with, no, that one is mine, no, this is mine, that, that, those are mine. And Jesus is stopping people from moving through. As all of that chaos is happening, Jesus taught them and he said, Is it not written, my house will be called a house of the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers? Is, it not, uh, is, is that not what my house is for? We say, yes, Peter, that's exactly. We should be in the church about God's holiness. And you're right. But this is not the temple of God. This is the temple of the Most High. That is the temple of the Most High. We are the temple of the Almighty. The main purpose of this called serve was so that the Gentiles could see, so that they could have a place where they could come for prayer and meditation. What is the purpose of us being God's temple but to be open to Him to do what He wants to do, not only for us, but also for those around us? Scripture is clear, Jesus is clear how important is our times of worship, times when we come together, we hear the Word of God, we listen to the Word of God, we say amen to it, we sing about it. We must understand what the temple is for, what God's house is for, but we must also understand what God's house is for. The question that this encounter of Jesus with the temple and the fig tree asks us is, are we about him? Do we understand who we are? When a seeking heart enters our churches, what do they find? It is a question we should ask, always. Not only in Kingsway, but in every church. If those that see God walk through the doors, will they find Him? It's a question we should ask. But a question closer to heart would be, when people encounter you, when they walk through the courts of you, the temple of the Most High, what do they find? What do they see? Because make no mistake, the Lamb that brought salvation in each and every one is also the King of righteousness in each and every one of us, is the Holy One in each and every one of us. He has not changed. Amen? Who God is in you will speak, will preach to those moving through the courts of you, the temple of the Most High, proclaiming either Him or being about everything and anything but. There was a response to all of this in verse 18. Read it with me. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and they began looking for a way to kill Him, for they feared Him. Because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. Two very different responses. The crowd was amazed. And they were drawn to him. The teachers of the law were afraid and they wanted to kill him. Because they did not like what he was saying. What he was about. Make no mistake, the only question of any significance ever in your life, there's a lot of important questions, but this question stands so far above all of them that it cannot be even written in the same book. The only question of any significance is what are you going to do with Jesus? He is who He is, and we are who we are in Him. Amen. He calls us His ambassadors. 
Scripture calls us those that carry the fragrance of Christ. Now let's get to application time. Because it's so good if we can just leave a sermon. Okay, just leave, stop now. Close now. Let me ask you. Because if I say, if whom and whosoever, and you, let me ask you. As your family spends time in the courts of your temple, what do they feel? What do they experience? Your friends, those that are seeking and those that are not, when they come in and out of his temple within you, what do they find? What do they experience? What are they left with? As it was in the day of our Lord Jesus there, it is still that way today. You're either one of gonna either gonna wish he never came, or you're gonna be amazed. Do you know who Jesus was fighting for in the temple? Let me make sure that you get this, son. Why do you think Jesus was so adamant about what he did? Was there anything unclear about how Jesus felt that day? You see? If we don't get that Jesus was fighting for the Gentiles, Jesus was saying to them, you cannot be like this because then they won't know me. Then they, they won't see me. They will get a wrong representation of me. Christ is turning over a few tables. Well, let me... Let me not make you feel guilty. There's a few turned tables in my life. And when I look at them, as I gaze upon my journey with him, I thank God for fighting for those around me when I could not. I thank God for addressing me so that those that came thirsty could drink. I thank God for some turned over tables so that they would ju not just find beer, because then they would have nothing. Even worse, they would have me. Please do not encounter the turned tables of your life and try to explain him away, number one. Do not try to stop him when he comes and enters the temple of your house and say, hey, this does not belong. This should not be. Stop doing that. Change this. He's fighting for you. Please remember, just the day before, Jesus stood at the edge of Jerusalem and wept and cried for his people because they went about their business. They looked all good at the temple on the outside, but they were busy with the wrong things. You might say, Piet, we lost the fig tree somewhere. Were you not thinking that? Well, I was. So when I'm in doubt, I read on. So 
So this is what happened. In the morning as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. And Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. Let me explain. With Jesus, there is no seasons. A fig tree has seasons. That's why when you just see the tree and Jesus and the fig tree cursed, you might think that he was unfair. But if you listen to his sermon, Jesus is saying, hey, please don't let them come to you and just find leaves. Please don't let them come knocking. Please don't let them walk like me past the tree of your life and find no fruit. Please don't look good from afar, but the closer they get, the more they realize there is no fruit. Let me leave you one more thing. Isn't it interesting that Peter would say, Lord, see the fig tree has dried up from the roots. Jesus said, I am the vine. You are the branches. He that remains in me will bear much fruit. This is to my Father's glory. Why? Because through our love and the fruit that he produces within our lives, those that do not know him and seek him might eat from what you cannot produce yourself. Please remember, you are a temple of the living God, but you are a tree, a branch that is in the vine called to bear fruit. Fruit is never for the tree. This is so serious. Let me just, have you ever seen an apple tree eat pears? Have you ever seen an apple tree eat apples for them? Anyone? Oh, and how we are so proud of the fruit. We, uh, you know, I'm so patient. <laughs> the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and long-suffering, self-control, all of these things. They're not for you. Who are they for? Who was the temple of the, or the, who, what was the court of the Gentiles? Who was it for? It's for them. Never forget. The lion and the lamb is one and the same. If I can leave you with a simple encouragement this morning, welcome him. Welcome him as the lamb. Welcome him as the lion. It's a confronting thing when Jesus gets angry. But his anger brings along his righteousness in us. And his anger is provoked when our lives and those around us, when their lives are in danger. That is when his meekness is revealed not as weakness, but as power under control. Amen. Is it clear? Can I pray for all of us? Is that okay? Would you close your eyes? I do feel that I want to give you an opportunity if you say, Lord, I have... I got this wrong. And I know you're addressing my heart this morning. Lord, I can sense you. I can feel that you're turning over some tables in me. And I want to say, Lord, please do. If this is you, raise your hand quickly. I want to pray for you. Oh, there's so many people. Just, you can put your hands down. Heavenly Father. My God. 
Lord, I, I want to just simply say, welcome, come. Come and clean the cords of my life. I pray for those, Lord, specifically that raised their hands this morning and said, Lord, I know you're talking to me. With them, I want to say, Lord, turn it over, Lord. Throw it over. Throw it out. Don't leave anything that is not of you. Make me a temple for your glory. Make me a house, a home of the living God. Make me a temple filled with the fragrance of the Most High. Lord, would you make me a different kind of a fig tree? I know, Lord, that you don't just give water in certain seasons. You don't just give life in certain seasons. It is in season and out of season where you work within me, where you work within us the fruit that you desire to give and to bestow on those around us. So I want to pray specifically for those that say, Lord, I look at the tables that you've turned and I was so angry. I was so frustrated with you, God. Just like those commentaries, I thought it was so unfair. But today, I just want to say sorry. I come with them, Lord. I, we want to say sorry, sorry that, that we didn't see what you were doing. But we want to say, Lord, just leave them overturned. Leave them the way they are so that we can see. So that they can be a reminder for me. God, I want to be about you. Fig tree full of leaves and full of fruit. A temple. A house of prayer and praise. And the presence of the Almighty. This is me. Show me, Lord. Show us. Make us. Pray in your wonderful name. Amen.